Hi, I'm Kevin Williamson, and this is How the World Works, where we have conversations about work and jobs, uh, both in terms of our own work and what jobs do in the economy and in society. I'm here with uh, one of my my favorite people uh, in terms of you know public intellectuals and writers and such is Professor Brian Kaplan of George Mason University. Uh, I was an economist and the author of a whole bunch of books with provocative titles and themes. Uh, I relied on the myth of the rational voter for many, many columns uh, over the years, so it's been a useful book that way. Also, author of The Case Against Education and uh, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, uh, among others. Most recently, I think it's most recently, is, is Labor Econ versus the World. Is that right? There's actually three more since then. Three more since then. He's a very prolific writer. What are the three since then? The three more since then are How Evil Are Politicians, Don't Be a Feminist, and Voters as Mad Scientists. Uh, I've got a series of books of essays, so I've done four, and there's four more to go. That all sounds like a lot of work. Uh, do you sleep? or? Well, actually, this is the, these are the easiest books I've ever written because they're collections of previously written essays. It's uh, just, just a matter of going through 5,000 old things that I wrote and finding which things actually pass the test of time. The compendium yes. is, is, is really the key to workplace happiness, which is getting paid twice for the same work. Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. So the first question I always like to ask people is, what do you do? I am primarily an economics professor. Most people think that means that I am a teacher, but actually the dirty secret of academia is that we barely do any teaching at all. I actually do what is considered a normal teaching load, and that comes out to 150 hours per year. All right, so that's all that's going on on the teaching side. The main thing I really do is what's called research, which at this stage in my career is really just writing on whatever I want to write on, as well as sometimes to do podcasts, other things like that. So that is the job of professor. I also do try to be entrepreneurial, so I have a bunch of other things that I've got going on at the same time. Uh, happy to talk about those, too, if you want. Sure. So when you say research as an economist, is there actually a lot of research in economics or is it more just sort of thinking about things and writing through? I would say that out of most people who are considered researchers, most of them do work with data. They do statistical analysis of either publicly available data or sometimes they'll create their own data, which is way more work. Mm -hmm. And then they write it up. Uh, usually, actually, these days as part of a team, uh, there's a separate craft of doing pure economic theory, which is really a pile of math. Uh, in that sense, there is thinking about the math and then working it out and then writing it up. And then, of course, there's defining research more broadly. So I, mean, I tend to, at this point in my career, write books where I often draw upon the empirical research that other people have done. But a lot of what I think of myself as doing is finding research that's actually very important, but it's super boring to almost everyone else in the world, and try to go and piece that kind of research together and really weave a whole story about why 200 different articles that you've never heard of actually point to something that you would care about, even though if you read them individually, you couldn't care less. So you're a PR man for boring math. You could think of that. I mean, I, like I say synthesis. Synthesis <laughs> is more prestigious than just being a PR man. I mean, it's true. It's not like I just go to each person and say, here's why you're, this guy's actually interesting, though he seems boring. Instead, I try to go and take hundreds of pieces of research and snap them all together into a picture that I think that many of the researchers themselves would object to. and say, hey, why am I being conscripted into this horrible cause? And I say, well, you fit. Like, <laughs> like it's not my fault that your research actually says something that you wish it didn't that, that I, yes that, you know, <laughs> or that or that it just becomes part of a broader issue that you never really thought about uh, so that's a lot of what i do i also i mean i do a lot of public speaking mm -hmm. uh, that's something where a lot of professors will go and give talks to other schools most professors will never get paid a dime for any talk they do in their entire career there's just not demand uh, for most professors honestly to just get a paid trip anywhere that's great, but they don't expect to get any money for it. Uh, I actually have managed to leverage most of my books into speaking gigs all over the world. A lot of that is that I just write them more interesting things, but it's also marketing. I do, I've been blogging for almost 20 years now. I was blogging for the Liberty Fund blog, and now I've got my own on Substack, uh, putting it all together. I mean, honestly, so I, mean, I do write books that people buy, so I do get some money from those, but the money that I get from speaking about those books is many times more than the actual books. Mm -hmm. So before academic life, what were you doing? 
What are the kind of jobs have you had in your <laughs> course of your career? I mean, I want to say, like, before academic life, I've not been, I've been, I've not been out of school since I was five years old. Right. Uh, but I did have a number of other jobs along the way. Let's see. I actually was a child laborer in a quite Dickensian occupation, which you may even have trouble believing existed in the 1980s, but I assure you it did. I was a manual assembler of the Los Angeles Times when I was in junior high and high school. Putting inserts into newspapers and stuff? Yes. Uh, so basically every Saturday I would go and manually assemble 1,000 copies of the Los Angeles Times for one penny per newspaper. And it involved, there were just three pieces, and I would take the uh, rightmost one, put it on top of the middle one, stuff it into the leftmost one, and that was one penny. So I did that for quite a few years, just as a Saturday job. Yes, I'm seeing the look on your face. Well, like, this job existed in the '80s. It really did. Well, no. So I was a, I was a newspaper editor a lot of my life, and I've we had machines for that. Why were they paying this? This was penny? the final stage. So yes, they had machines to assemble the parts, but then they would deliver the individual parts of the Sunday paper to a distribution center. And that distribution center hired kids to go and do the last stage. I'm an economist. I'll say I believe that they did it that way because it was cheaper to do it that way than to do it with yeah. machines. As to why it, what was going on, so it was only on Sunday. So my guess is that looking back, that it wasn't essentially only the Sunday newspaper was big enough for this job to be necessary, and then it wasn't worth coming up with machines to only use once a week. That's my best story. Also, you got preprints on Sundays, so parts of the newspaper would be printed earlier in the week. So so they're not there in the press to be automatically inserted. Not for this job, at least. No. For this job, what was going on was that they definitely got three separate deliveries of the three separate parts. Hmm. And I knew because I would sit around waiting on call for the different sections to be delivered. And then finally, I would get a call from the assistant manager who would say, you know, like, like, all, like everything's in, come down. And then my mom would go and give me a ride to this place to do my Dickensian job. Uh, but yeah, so I did that. Let's see, I did some data entry when I was in college. And then pretty soon, you know, so that was just for a bank where I would just go and you know, manually type in numbers for mm -hmm. mortgages, right? Uh, which, again, you might have trouble believing. So this job existed in the early 90s. It still did. So weren't there computers? Yeah, there were computers. And I was the person that put the numbers into the computers. So there was that. Uh, after that, I managed to go and weasel my way into more academic jobs. I was a research assistant on the collected works of Hayek, hmm. uh, which I don't quite remember how I managed to talk my way into that job, but I did. And basically what that meant was that I went over the footnotes of Hayek's Counter-Revolution of Science, and I checked them. Normally, this would mean manually, where I would go to the UC Berkeley Library where I was a student, and I would actually request the incredibly obscure books in many different languages that Hayek was citing. And then my job was actually to go and make sure that he had cited them correctly. Uh, he's doing it in about four or five different languages. So most, like the only ones that I really could even pretend to do would be English, Spanish, and German. And, like the Spanish and German wouldn't have been very good. Uh, so I would actually do line by line checks of the quotes. Mm -hmm. Um, that was an interesting job because I found out that Hayek was really sloppy. Was he? <laughs> uh, like, like, apparently he would just quote from memory in multiple languages, and uh, usually he would have the gist of it. But it was quite shocking how poorly quoted, uh, how poor the accuracy was. And then every now and then he'd actually go and omit a word that would completely reverse the meaning of the quote. So you think Hayek would have a hard time getting a job as a professor at George Mason? <laughs> well, in my department, where we really make sure everyone quotes everything perfectly. Uh, however, as you may have heard, there's actually a lot of, there's a lot of low standards in academia, so people have managed to get publications mm. that, in hindsight, perhaps should have just gotten them an F in an intro class because they were making stuff up. But well, that's actually an interesting work question. So why are there such low standards in academia in some places? Because mm -hmm. these are highly sought after jobs. So the people who are doing mm -hmm. the hiring have a lot of people to choose from. Why aren't they getting better people? Fantastic question. And I know about this in great detail because I've been on almost every stage of this process. I've been on the initial hiring stage. I've been on the oversight committee for giving tenure to people. The main thing that I can tell you is that 
there's basically two totally different systems in academia. At the very top schools, they have a shareholder or partner mentality where they basically think we don't want to let in anybody who's not awesome because it dilutes the values of our shares. Say so that's most departments at the very top, maybe the top 20, 30 schools where they consider it to be each person they hire is a reflection of them. They're very mind. They're they're very status conscious. So there's that part of academia, but that's only like twenty or thirty schools. As soon as you get below that, the system becomes extremely nepotistic very quickly. Except of course my own department, and the nepotism comes down to once we know you, we know your kids, then we want to give you a job for life, almost regardless of what you've accomplished or what you've done. So really, for almost all professors, the key cutoff is, can you get the initial desirable job? Right out of grad school, that job is based just upon potential, someone's guess about what you can do, connections, whether you got a good mafia working for you. And once you get those jobs at most schools, not the top ones, but at most schools, then it's really your job to lose. Hmm. Right. And, and again, as to why it is so, or the standards are so low, well, the main thing to understand is that the typical academic article, especially by someone who's at one of these weaker schools, uh, will be read by maybe one or two people on earth ever. So there's just not a lot of pressure to go and get it right or even to be careful. Often even you will know, even have the semblance of quality. So the thing to understand about academia is it's basically a bunch of workers cooperatives. Each department decides who to hire and whether or not to give you a dream job for life after they have hired you. So if those people like you and their standards are low, then you're in. The only hard part is getting that original job. What you see when you're on the oversight committee for tenure, this is where basically they bring in outsiders to try to get the nepotism someone under, under control. I really believe in bringing nepotism under control, but almost no one else on these committees does, as I found out. What you realize when you are on these committees is just the standards are really low and I'll also, but like you also really, at least I felt just the great unfairness of the system because in a department like, oh, I don't know, English, they will be, I know. yeah, they'll be handing out tenure to people for publishing their freaking dissertation. So you get to work on some book nobody's going to read for, say, eight years. Then you get hired and you spend five more years polishing this masterwork for publication with some low level university press. And then they hand out a dream job for life for that. And then here's the thing, you, I know very well that there's a bunch of other people with PhDs in English who are much better teachers, who have way better publication records, but because they didn't get that initial nepotistic boost, they're just sort of flying Dutchman for their whole career. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, the nonprofit sector simply does not work. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the best solution there is just more turnover? Hmm. I mean, I would say like, you know, to start, you know, just having tenure is a really bad idea for most places. I mean, really, I would just say everywhere tenure is a bad idea. Almost the only exception, the only real value of tenure is in highly politicized fields mm -hmm. that have a few dissidents. <laughs> Which are the fields that aren't highly politicized? I would say that even now, mathematics is not highly politicized. Mm -hmm. STEM in general, there are some subfields like climatology that for obvious reasons are highly politicized. But the highly politicized fields where there's some dissent, mm. there's also highly politicized fields where I would just say there's no dissent. So again, there's only and like no dissent. That sounds like an exaggeration. I would just say like in some, in a field like women's studies, I think it is fair to say there is no dissent. There's no one saying this field is really unfair and our basic methods are just designed to go and get our foregone conclusions. You guys are terrible. I'm going to take out the trash and set this field to right. Like, 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 I just think that there's just no one in that field that is like that. Um, but, you know, so, you know, so like, like I would say, like in the field of economics, um, it's moderately politicized, but there's still enough dissent that having tenure means that someone, say, like me, who has dissident views can play the game until they get tenure and then afterwards pull off the mask. Uh, since I'm at George Mason, I never had to do that, but I definitely know a lot of other economists at other departments who probably couldn't get a, gotten hired if people knew what their real views were, but they just played the game until they had tenure, and that does give us a bit of intellectual diversity, but... I mean, but honestly, if you say, should we save the whole tenure system for that? No. The whole mm -hmm. world should not revolve around me and a few of my buddies. And yeah, it's just a terrible system, which we see basically operating nowhere else in the world. So, so you're reminding me of um, 
Well, I, I generally think of it as the worst job I ever had, <laughs> which was I worked at a, at a newspaper that was not a very good newspaper. And that happens from time to time. But it was also one in which the management and the staff seemed pretty happy with the mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there wasn't any desire to get better. And working in a place with that kind of culture and that kind of environment, I found just really depressing. I mean, they, they paid me fine. The work wasn't very difficult. And it was more money than I'd made any job before that. But um, working in a place that um, had almost a corporate commitment to uh, mediocrity <laughs> felt uh, it was just really dispiriting. It's not the kind of thing you want to stay up till mm -hmm. three o'clock in the morning as you do at newspapers um, to uh, to do every day. So I'm wondering, what uh, what's the worst job you've ever had? Wow, the worst job I ever had. I mean, I think the here's only, an invitation yeah. to burn some bridges, yes. Brian. <laughs> like, like the honest answer would be that. Let's see. So actually, no, I'm going to go with the telework job that I run the no, excuse me, not telework, the data entry job that okay. I had. Yeah, there were no telework jobs in those days. No, the data entry job that I had the summer after my first year of college, where I was just typing numbers into the computer for the mortgage company. Because it was boring? Or? Yeah, it was, it was boring and I was alone. So that uh, Dickensian job, I actually did it with a couple of my best friends. And that was what made it fun. Mm -hmm. This is actually a general lesson about work and life is that the main thing most people get out of any social interaction is enjoying the company of the people they're with. So that job I was basically alone. There were a few guys that were my supervisors who would uh, talk with me a bit. I was able to go and listen to music. Uh, so I had my my portable CD player in those days. Yeah. Let's um, dig into that a little bit because, you know, when we talk about work mm -hmm. and jobs, the first thing we think about is a paycheck. Yeah. And uh, but at a certain level of income, and it's not really even all that high, mm -hmm. jobs become about lots of other things. Oh, yeah. I, I would hate to guess what share of people in the workforce are in jobs where they could get paid more doing something else. Mm -hmm. But I imagine it's pretty high, but they stay where they are in the industry they're in and the position they're in mm -hmm. because there are non-financial rewards to being in that mm -hmm. job. Oh, yeah. So, um, I mean, literally, there's almost no one who couldn't go and get a higher paid job. I always tell my students about, you want to start making a lot of money this summer? Work on a fishing boat in Alaska. They hire college men, no, mm -hmm. probably not college women, but um, even back you know, 30 years ago, I heard they were paying $10,000 a summer if you stick it out. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot of people who've never done manual labor who go and sign up for that job. And then after two days of being on a fishing boat in Alaska, they say, I got to get out of here. And then they wind up having to pay all their expenses, which if they'd stuck it out, would have been paid. Uh, but yeah, it is totally true that that is the main reason. There's also interesting work done on lottery winners. Most lottery winners don't quit their jobs, hmm. right? And it seems like the main reason they do quit their jobs is just the money alienates them from their coworkers. It's not that they really just want to be idle for the rest of their lives. Let's talk a little bit about that sort of um, you know, job as center of, of social life, which it is a thing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, work is where people used to meet, you know, spouses and, and yeah. things like that, although it's gotten more complicated in recent years. <laughs> Uh, it's most people's main main social interaction over the course of the day. I mean, it's not for me because I write from home and I live in a cave and don't talk to people and I'm kind of happy that way. But for normal people, it's um, it's it's an enormously social kind of uh, enterprise. Mm -hmm. Without that, people not only lose the income, but they lose all the other sorts of things they were getting from their jobs as well. Oh, yeah. Or if they take a um, you know, sort of step in the wrong direction that way, they end up with um, a position that may or may not be financially uh, satisfying, but with... Um, you know, a situation in which they're spending half their waking hours doing something they they hate. Mm -hmm. So how do we people, how do we deal with that situation? How do we get people to uh, understand their incentives and their opportunities maybe better than they do sometimes? Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Of course, the, like the, you know, the, what I always tell people is, you know, keep your eyes open, look around the world for something you would like doing better for better packages, talk to people that have the job that you want to have, and then try to reverse engineer it. Uh, specifically, I always tell people, talk to someone who's like five to 10 years more senior than you. Don't talk to someone who's 60 years or like into their career because like what they tell you might not and probably won't even apply anymore. But talk to someone five to 10 years ahead of yourself. Uh, and then I always invoke what I call the first law of wing walking. The uh, first law of wing walking says, don't let go of what you're holding on to until you're hold holding on to something else first. Mm -hmm. It's from the early days of aerobatics when acrobats would get on planes and do stunts. Don't let go of what you're holding on to until you're holding on to something else first. But if you are not happy with their job, always say, like, don't quit your job. It's hard to get a job if you don't have a job. There's a, a good evidence that employers consider this to be a negative sign. They want to get someone they want to poach someone they don't want to get someone who is strangely 
unemployed despite seemingly to be seeming to be awesome. It's like, hmm, what's going on there? Mm. Uh, so just go keep your eyes open, talk to people that have a job that you would like to get, find out how they did it, and then just try to strike when the iron is hot. Uh, during COVID, I was telling people this is a fantastic time to try to get a job that is that you don't have the right credential for. Hmm. Right, because this is when employers have unusually open minds. They're desperate for workers. Normally, they'll throw your application away in the trash because you don't have the right credential. But under these conditions, maybe you can weasel your way in. And once you're in, you're in. You can skip maybe like actually like a full PhD if you really are able to find a good opportunity. And I am I feel really good that a number of my readers have emailed me and said they tried this and it works and it didn't work every time. But they said like I just applied for ten jobs that I was underqualified for and I got one and now I've got it and I'm doing great and now I don't have to get an extra degree. Well, yeah, I'm not sure how true this is, um, whether it's borne out empirically, but there's um, a general impression that men are more likely than women to apply for jobs for which they're not formally qualified. Hmm, that's an interesting point. Let's see. One of my favorite books is called Why Men Earn More by Warren Farrell. Mm -hmm. And it goes through 25 different things that women can do to make more money. So this is not a gotcha book saying, ha ha, women, this is why men men make more. This is a self-help book saying, hey, women, these are 25 things that men are doing that get them more money. And if you want to make more money, too, maybe you should think about doing some of them, not all 25, but doing some of them. I, I like uh, He has a lot of great things on the list, things like major in STEM, work late hours, work in an undesirable location. As to whether he says just apply for something that you're not formally qualified for, I don't think he does say that. He does say just take more risks and just try more things and you know, like so that kind of thing. Uh, so I think, that, like, I think you, you could file your question under stuff that he does have actual evidence for. But yeah, it seems very likely that men would just would, would be more inclined just to try to talk their way into a job that technically they're not qualified for and to see what happens. I'm interested in that question because of the growing prevalence of automation in selecting candidates for, for jobs. So of all the good jobs I've had in my life, none of them I would have had if I'd had to go through a system like that because I don't have mm. what are considered as the basic credentials mm. for the uh, jobs I've had in life, you know, lack of college degree, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think of the... Um, prevalence of such systems as being a, a sort of net loss for the labor market, certainly things that have significant downsides that maybe aren't appreciated. And the, um, you know, less formal, more sociable model of job searching, which tends to prevail at the high end of the economy anyway. You know, mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs doesn't find partners by putting out a help wanted ad yeah. and taking, you know, resumes through Monster or something yeah. like that. They, uh, they might pretend to do it. Well, I guess they have to pretend to it for, for legal reasons, right? Yes. Um, that um, I've been through that at a number of employers where we posted a job that we were hiring for, and they're like, yeah, don't bother really trying to get anyone for that. And uh, because it's 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 already been Busted. filled. And um, <laughs> it's kind of how life works. But what do you think about the... Um, it's not, how, it's not, it's not how life mixes. works. It's how regulation works and how lawsuits work and yeah. the crummy system that we have created based upon lies, deceit, and fear. Mm -hmm. Well, there's that, certainly. <laughs> but, um, lies and deceit is redundant, but lies and fear, let's say that. But say you're, you know, you're a 20-year-old who's not going to college, not a college graduate, and you're looking for a job, and all the jobs you want to get require you to go to a website and put in, this is what kind of education I have, this many years of experience, and these kind of empirical things that then go into some algorithm mm -hmm. and sort things out. That seems to me like not a good way to do things. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if that was my kid or a kid that I cared about, I would say, do that to the max. So you're mm. going to have like, like, so especially given that you don't look good on paper, you're just going to have to play the odds. There's still just a lot of randomness in the world. So you just put in enough applications like that, often something will turn up and then you'll be in a position to talk your way in. But then I would say, but don't only do that. The you know, like much more fruitful path is to go and actually try to meet people in the industry where you want to get jobs. Right. And then uh, you know, make some friends and, and you know, find out how it is they did what, they, what, did what they're doing. Find out whether there's, whether there's back doors or, uh, or, or other secret passages into the job that you want. So I would say do that as well. Right. And just uh, and then finally, I'd say and then maybe you just can't do it this way. Maybe you've got to just suck it up and go to college. Sorry. Some of your advice there really relies on being you know, kind of sociable and outgoing and good at making mm -hmm. friends and developing relationships and things like that. Right, Which, or at least being willing to learn. Like, no, <laughs> like, like, it, like yeah. almost no one on earth is good at this stuff at first. Like this goes back to Aristotle. How does anybody get good at anything? By trying when you suck. Mm. 
try. Like, like, I can't try. I suck. That's how you stop sucking. <laughs> and what is, what is Greek for I suck? I can't remember, but um, you know, as, as Aristotle no doubt put it. But there are enormous economic premia uh, for certain kinds of personality types and things like things that aren't just interchangeable things. You can't uh, go to, uh, you know, a, a class and, and, and work out. I think you're almost certainly right. You don't see it in the data. No, but that's probably just because the data isn't that good. So like, like uh, one of my big interests is personality psychology. It is not true that extroverts grossly out earn introverts, hmm. which is a puzzle, right? Uh, because you see, it sure seems like people that have tons of friends would then have to more connections and would be able to have their pick of better jobs. We don't see this going on in the data. So my view is that while personality psychology is useful in many ways, Probably the measures of personality are just not the, uh, that good. It's too based upon self-reports. It's not really getting to the heart of the matter. There's different stories that you might tell, like, well, maybe extroverts combine being more sociable at work with being more sociable in, at play, and the play often winds up overshadowing the work. So, you know, you know, we think about like the party girl at college who fails out because she was making too many friends. Yeah. Right. So could be that extroversion has uh, some a good and bad side. And the problem with the standard measure is it captures both. And that's why we don't see this actual payoff. But yeah, like my two older sons are very introverted and I'm always encouraging them, like make friends, make connections. And they say, dad, we all know that extroversion does not predict income. And I'm like, I know that son, I'm the one who told you that, <laughs> but still like on some level, this ha it has to be true that making business connections pays off. Yeah. Well, I think maybe your your views on this are a little warped by the fact that you live in, in the world of economists. So you've never met any socially awkward, uh, introverted <laughs> people in, in your whole life. Uh, certainly, that's just never been a thing you've come across. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for the irony impaired, I, mean, I would say that I know a much larger number of people who are socially awkward than people who aren't. And guess what? I would totally put myself into the socially awkward category, at least by disposition. I think over time I've improved tremendously. Mm -hmm. If you just la are laughing at this and saying, well, what were you like before? And like, before I didn't even know I had a problem. <laughs> right. So like I've improved enormously over time. Um, you know, every now and then I'll have a person saying like, oh, like you think that you got social skills now that I like, well, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, well, at least I have the social skills to not talk to other people like that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I have the social skills to have a conversation about social skills with a guy wearing a Dungeons and Dragons t-shirt. So uh, there's that in life. Yeah, like like I, I, I'm here to give hope to people and just to say, <laughs> just because you love Dungeons and Dragons doesn't mean that you can't flourish in life. Of course you can. Right. And there's probably a lot of other people that are, want to reach out to you because, you know, like you play D&D, &D too. Yeah. I'm going to repeat something I said in an, in an earlier episode uh, because I think it's a conversation worth having again. But one of my sort of little things that sticks in my craw and I talk about a lot is that in our, our conversation about um, economic mobility, education, jobs, how that works together, we spend a lot of time talking about the wrong people, I think. So we've just gone through this whole national convulsion and Supreme Court case about how they let students into Harvard. You know, as I, I, I I'm, forgive, forgive me for repeating myself here for people who are listening, but, you know, if you're sort of on the cusp of getting into Harvard or not getting into Harvard, you're probably going to do OK in life. <laughs> like if your worst case scenario is you have to go to Stanford or something else or, or God help us, George Mason University, that's, you know, your worst case scenario is a lot of people's best case mm -hmm. scenario or better than their best case scenario. But we don't talk a whole lot about people who don't, say, finish high school. Vocational training and things like that still kind of has bad odor uh, on it in some circles, I think. I think there's been a generations long over correction to the issue of tracking, uh, deciding that, you know, some people probably aren't going to college and we should shape their education in various ways. It's going to prepare them for what they are going to do in life. But because the, the conversation is really dominated typically by people who went to elite universities or want their kids to, um, or, you know, um, or who have some sort of social um, connection to that world, people in the media, people in the public policy world, they care a lot about who gets into Harvard and who doesn't get into mm -hmm. Harvard, whereas most people's lives, that is a thousand degrees uh, removed from. <laughs> totally. What's the question, though? Well, the question is, um, how big a problem is that, I suppose? Yeah. Um, are there ways to correct it? And is there maybe some way to get the class of you know two or three percent of the population that really dominates the conversation in in all of these things to 
get outside of its own interests and biases and uh, and start thinking about the world that's beyond um, the college campuses and the New York Times and the Atlantic and the sort of institutions mm -hmm. with which they are familiar and connected. I mean, I would say that I've done more than almost anyone to try to go and grab these people by the shoulders and say, hey, your tiny world is barely anything. Um, my book, The Case Against Education, talks about a lot of these issues. Uh, the you know, Probably the biggest issue I talk about is, in the book is credential inflation. So we can really see that over time, the amount of education that you need to get a job has risen much faster than the amount of education that you really need to do a job. The explanation that I have is that while Education is not very good at training people for jobs. It is the standard way that we use to sort people out. It's the standard way that people go and say, hey, look at me, don't throw my application away. The real problem there, I say, is that the more education people have, the more they need to not have their application thrown in the garbage. A lot of what's going on, I would say, is that elites feel like, well, or right, maybe not everybody needs to go to Harvard, but everyone does need to go to college. They have adopted a lot of policies to make it much easier and cheaper and more affordable to go to college. Uh, whenever you hear people saying college is incredibly expensive, it's incredibly expensive for a tiny number of people. Most people, it actually is not a big financial burden. Uh, but the real issue is that the more people go, the worse it looks if you don't go. And so it is not really a way of actually creating opportunity on balance. It creates opportunity for people to do well in school. But on the other hand, it takes opportunities away from people that don't. You're talking about these portals where if you don't fit the official qualifications, you don't even get considered. That is not a world, the way the world used to work. The way the world used to work was much more of get an entry level job and work your way up. And then there's also a college track for a small number of people. Over time, that college track has expanded more and more and more to the point where, as economist Richard Vedder puts it, we almost need to get a master's in janitorial science to get a job cleaning bathrooms. So we're not quite there yet, but we are pretty close to that kind of nonsense. So just to realize that expanding, expanding access to education has a massive downside. It is not just a no-brainer where if everybody goes to college, we can all have good jobs. That is just flatly false. We really can see that the amount of education that people have for quite menial jobs keeps going up. It's not just that uh, people happen to be, you know, with a college job, happen to be tending bar. It's like, if this basically didn't happen in the past. Uh, rather, it is just that there's uh, so many people with these degrees that inevitably there aren't enough good jobs for them. And you know, especially for if you don't really learn how to do anything in college, it's not too mysterious why the world isn't saying, oh my God, uh, we need to go and hire this person because they have mastered Danish poetry or something like that. So yeah, it's a very unfortunate system. It is one where I'd say government is almost the whole problem, especially just the massive funding of education. We've got over a trillion dollars a year of government subsidies in favor of the status quo. I have occasionally heard economists say, well, the current system passed the market test. And I almost want to tear up my hair and say, are you out of your mind? That's like saying that a football stadium funded entirely by the government passed the market test. The education system is the exact opposite of passing the market test. It's a totally bloated white elephant. And if we really want to see what passed the market test, take away those massive subsidies and see what happens, then, of course, there's going to be a lot of people that are could have done well in college that don't go, which means the stigma against not going goes down. Yeah. Years and years ago, there was a guy who was the um, chancellor of the University of Texas system, and he gave um, an unfortunately um, honest interview in which he managed to tell the truth about something when he shouldn't have. <laughs> and they were asking him about uh, rising tuition. This would have been the early 1990s. And he said, well, you know, UT, we could we could operate the school without charging tuition at all. And we have enough money you know, from the state and from our trust fund and all that. We don't really need tuition to do anything. Uh, we use tuition because they won't let me raise academic standards and we have to keep the population down somehow. <laughs> and um, he uh, he was he was not celebrated for those those remarks. Yeah. But um, I, now, as I understand it, the role of tuition has um, increased in UT's finances since then. I've, I've written about it subsequently. But there is still that kind of weird, perverse relationship of um, of not being able to to do things that probably ought to be done for uh, mm -hmm. political reasons, of course, because when you're controlled by mm -hmm. state funding, you're controlled by by the state. So do you think that um, what do you think would actually happen if we if we put the education system to a real market test and just took out the subsidies? What would it look like, you think, in 10 years? So, first of all, the, I mean, after yeah, the yeah. after the blood yes. was cleaned up. Yeah. 
So there's actually a bunch of papers that estimate what is the effect of rate of lowering tuition on college attendance and college graduation. And we can just take these papers, which are, of course, have, you know, they do have an agenda, but I think that they are still high quality papers. But they're really trying to carefully measure these effects. But we can just go and multiply those by negative one and find out what would happen if we were to go and raise tuition. I'd say that if we really just cut out all of it, then I'd say, though, so right now, out of all high school graduates, technically we have about 70% that go on to some kind of college. A lot of that is community college where it just fizzles out. And uh, But still, probably about, see, I think it's almost half of high school graduates are going on to a four-year college. If it was unsubsidized, I think that would actually probably fall by about 80%. So I think mm. we'd go from about half of high school graduates going to college to only about 10% because Two things. First of all, just the cost would be high, so a lot of people wouldn't want wouldn't want to pay it. If we get rid of the subsidies, it's also getting rid of subsidized student loans, so you wouldn't even have that route. You'd have to get an actual market rate loan for that money. Uh, that's not a very appealing option, right? Would but, the cost be high? So uh, I, I, mm. I, I I've read that you know in in real terms the cost of going to say Harvard in 1920. Mm was was really pretty low compared to what people mm -hmm. pay to pay to go to a, a mediocre college today um, now i assume it would stay high if everything remained the same on the mm -hmm. on the other side as it is now but certainly that would produce results in terms of how universities are run and organized. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the very elite schools, I think, would barely change. They, they, you're right. They're so rich. They, they can, they, they, you know, Harvard's got like a $40 billion endowment. They, and like, they can do anything within the range of what you can imagine. But for most schools, on the other hand, um, you know, so they are tuition dependent. Uh, it's true that with you know, large fall in demand, prices would go down. But still, like, you know, these are crummy, mismanaged nonprofits. I think the main thing is that they're just not going to really do what it takes to go and save themselves. But also, like, you know, there are there are some fundamental economic differences between today and 1920. It's like there's uh, something called the cost disease of the service sector. I think it's greatly overrated, but still, it's not completely wrong. It just comes down to Barbering technology has not changed in 100 years, and yet barbers make way more money than in the past. Why? Because of competition for other option, for other uses of that barber's labor. Same thing goes for a lot of college, that while the people that work there are getting paid a lot, and they're getting paid a lot more, but a lot of the reason is just that they could be doing something else. Probably not the English professors. <laughs> uh, their other options are limited. But in any case, so I do think it's reasonable that there would be a large fall now. But there's another reason why people would lose interest, which is that the number of smart, hardworking, team-oriented, conformist kids that are that are that are not going to college goes up. This means that employers suddenly will say, "Hey, there's a lot of talent in the non-college pool. I'm going to start hiring, or at least being more open-minded about hiring non-college workers." Which is another reason not to go to college. It's like, "Hey, I don't have to go anymore." So, yeah. so you've got that as well. I mean, I do I think. You know, probably like like it'll, what you have left is for certain fields where there they, there really is a lot of intense training that college provides. Like in STEM, there's you know something there. Even that, I think a lot of that could be learned in apprenticeships. But at least it's more plausible. There's something concrete being taught in class. Uh, of course, it is a social club, so for rich kids. Uh, but even there, once it no longer is weird not to go to college, I think you know, there's a lot of people say, well, maybe I should just buy a country club membership and you get a job. How about that? <laughs> you know, I love the fact that uh, Kim Kardashian is is becoming a lawyer without going to law school <laughs> because I, I totally miss this. Oh, no. So you, in some places, including California, you can still do what's known as reading for the law, uh -huh. which is if you can do an apprenticeship with mm -hmm. a law firm and pass the bar, uh -huh. you don't have to go to law school to become a lawyer. And has Kim passed the bar? Uh, I think she's either taking it or has taken it, but she's working at a, a law firm and studying law and apparently intends to become a lawyer. And uh, who knows if she'll be successful uh, or her not. Her dad was a famous lawyer. Yes, yes. yes. All right. So, that's you know, crazy. we think of, of lawyers as being one of those jobs that absolutely requires a certain kind of degree. And, but that's a relatively new development. Mm -hmm. Now, none of us are around here are very big fans of, of occupational licensing, but the, one of the things I do like about occupational licensing is it gives someone a target to mm -hmm. aim at. Mm -hmm. And I often think about, you know, kids who are... 15, 16 years old in high school who are maybe smart and energetic, but not going to go to college because they don't like academic life and yep. they don't really care about school. They don't have, I, I think there's an information problem where they don't understand what their opportunities actually look mm -hmm. like in life. Mm -hmm. And if they do have kind of a goal in mind, 
there's not a really obvious way to connect with it. So if you want to become a lawyer, everyone knows what to do, right? You go to college, yeah. you go to law school, you pass the yep. bar, you work for a law firm, you're a lawyer. Um, but if you want to do you know, all sorts of you know, skilled blue collar work or other kinds of work, there's not a real obvious way to do it. You know, I, I interviewed a guy a few years ago who has, um, he has a really successful business manufacturing super high-end kitchen knives. His academic training was he has an MFA in creative writing and it turned out that he was a terrible uh, novelist and didn't enjoy writing very much, but he was pretty good at making knives. Uh, but if you told 16 year old him, yeah. hey, you can be a really successful knife maker, but where do you go? I mean, he apparently learned how to do it by watching YouTube videos and yeah. just through trial and error, but not everyone is going to um, mm -hmm. be able to succeed in that way. So what can we do to improve mm -hmm. what seems to me like a problem? Yeah, great question. There is a standard piece of propaganda in the K-12 system that we're making you study a lot of different things to give you a sample so that you can then choose between this great smorgasbord of different career options. And the propaganda, like the slogan is great. It should be the way that that's what's going on for in school. They should be give, exposing you to a smorgasbord of career options. But of course, the actual options you're exposed to are beyond stupid. It's like, oh, you could be a poet or a novelist or maybe a mathematician or you could be an historian. Or, you know, like, and it's just a, like you could be a professional athlete. It's just a giant list of absurd pipe dreams. What I'd say is it, it would be great for schools to actually take their own propaganda seriously and say, hey, let's let do, let's expose people to a wide variety of things. Let's try to go and give show people different options. But let's start with the list of jobs humans actually have commonly and then expose them to that. So if starting in, say, seventh grade, you would do two weeks each on 20 different common occupations, that I think would be fantastic. Right. And each one, someone say, well, I don't want to ever be this. So I don't want to be a knife maker. Like it's two weeks. Give it a chance. Right. End of two weeks. Like you don't want to be a knife. Maker? All right. Moving on, moving on. We're just going to keep doing other stuff. So this is something where like if schools actually really cared about giving exposing kids to opportunities and broadening their minds and expanding the horizons. And, you know, like, honestly, a lot of the people need to have their expansions, expansion or their, their, their horizons expanded are kids from families where everyone went to college and they've never thought about anything but college. Yeah. Right. So if you were to go and tell kids like that, hey, you know what? You could be an electrician. You could be a plumber. You can make a lot more money than a bunch of your relatives with fancy degrees. Do you really find the stuff that fascinating anyway? Right. These are other. So there's that group, too. Like almost all kids need to go and just be exposed to a wider number of options. Honestly, like a lot of the options you're going to say is, well, guess what? Elder care is going to be a big deal. Let's go and find out who likes elderly people and who has patience with them. Yeah. So that's something just to uh, tell people about. Right. But it's, it's, so that's I think is probably one of the very best things is as part of the school curriculum. Step one, expose people to a, to a lot of different realistic jobs, not these not like you could be a poet, which is just a stupid thing to tell a kid. So much better to give a talk saying you can't be a poet. <laughs> <laughs> Listen up, kids. No one can be a poet. That's so much closer to the truth than anyone can be a poet. You know, it's funny. I um for years, I would keep track of the best-selling books of poetry in uh, the United States <laughs> Good. and um, and look at what the actual numbers were. And if you take out, um, I'm going to date myself here a little bit, but Jewel, the singer, wrote uh -huh. a book of poems that actually sold a whole bunch, uh -huh. apparently. And a few other famous people, mostly musicians, I think Bob Dylan did one and maybe Lou Reed did one. One year, I think the best, you know, the, the, the best-selling book of poetry in the United States, new book of poetry, excluding textbooks, right? <laughs> I think it sold twelve hundred copies or something like that, wow. um, and that's that's even lower than my numbers, Brian. And that's um, that's saying something. You know, I gave a talk at a big state university a few years ago with a journalism program about why we should just close down journalism programs because they don't, you know, do anything for people. They don't claim to be journalists. So I am. Um, I'm skeptical of your answer just for this reason, that I, I, I hesitate over solutions that require the education system to do better things. Yeah, no, I, I do, too. I'm just saying, like, like, if you want to do better, this is what you would do. Are but, there other ways that we could maybe approach this without relying on the schools to be better? Mm -hmm. For instance, by having um, businesses take a more proactive role in, in helping to uh, prepare people or at least to help young people understand the opportunities that are out there for them. You always have businesses complaining about, mm -hmm. well, you know, we don't have enough people who are working in construction or we don't have enough people mm -hmm. who are in, you know, skilled building trades or those sorts of things. And, and of course, what 
I often tell them is if you if you tried offering more money for these jobs because maybe that would yeah. help. Yeah. But there is, I think, there there is a supply problem there in some ways. There aren't a lot of people um, necessarily going into to those positions. And part of it, I think, is the problem of you know, competition for status versus competition for income. Mm -hmm. uh, so people want jobs that sound uh, impressive, even if the jobs that sound like more, you know, common working class jobs actually in many cases pay more. Um, but if you is there something the business world can do to, to help to do that? There totally is, but I would not be optimistic about them doing it. So you know, I am an economist. I assume businesses are maximizing profits. The fact they're not doing something probably means that it would cost them more money than it would make them. Uh, the standard story from, I believe, economist Gary Becker is that if a business did have a big training program, the problem is that you're mostly training your future competitors. Mm -hmm. Most of those people are not going to stay with you for life. The only way it would really be profitable is if you would go and get them to pay you to go and do the training. So essentially, not just the unpaid internship, but the negative mm -hmm. the, the negative wage internship where they pay you, which, if you think about it, is basically just like a trade school. So that is the issue. Now, is there more room for trade schools to go and expand? Um, possibly. But again, it's like, well, if, they, if there's so much room, why haven't they done it yet? I mean, the main reason that I bring up the spend two weeks each on 20 different occupations idea is that normally standard vocational education gets unfairly stereotyped as you, you're 12, you're going to be a machinist. Right. And it's like, like, so like, is it like, does it really make sense? And isn't it just very narrow minded and even bigoted to go and look at a 12 year old and decide what they're going to do when they grow up? And I say, yeah, well, that would be, but that's not a reasonable way to even run vocational education. Much more reasonable to start it at a much younger age, expose them to a bunch of a bunch of different options. And then when they're 14, say, well, you've had two years of looking at different jobs. What seems like a good option now that where I think it makes a lot more sense to go and say, now we can specialize now that you've actually had a sampler of a whole bunch of different things that uh, you could do, what appeals to you at this point. Uh, so basically, you know, like, like my view is start vocational education much earlier, but basically have this pre-vocational education at a really early age just to go and expose people to the options. But yeah, I don't think the schools are likely to do it. There, I don't think the problem is that they don't have the money or anything. They're loaded with money. It's just that they have so much inertia and they're so totally full of their own self-righteousness of whatever it is they're doing is so great. So they just sit around congratulating themselves. Uh, Fairfax County Public Schools, oh, oh, the, the portrait of a graduate. This is their, their teaching philosophy. I remember when I was listening to them talk about it, like, you know, I don't want you to have a philosophy. Who, who dare you have a philosophy with taxpayer money? Just teach them to read and write and shut up about philosophy. But it's like, oh, yeah, I'm just a taxpayer. That means that you get my money whether or not I like you or not. It means you get my money whether or not I use your service or not. Damn it. That is a tough break. What do you think about um, labor union apprenticeship programs? They're any labor, good, worth yes. expanding, look worth looking into as a I mean, potential model? Apprenticeship, like I'm so favorable to it as an idea that I will forgive almost anyone that gets involved. Uh, like I am not a fan of labor unions. I mean, probably labor unions' primary goal there is to restrict apprenticeships so they don't have a lot of competition. Although they don't want to have it be zero, they do want there to be a future. So probably they are, again, just to sound like economists, they're optimizing, right? They're saying, well, let's get number of apprentices apprentices sufficient that we can continue our gig here or gig slash scam or whatever you want to call it without being overwhelmed. We don't want to have a whole bunch of non-union people that know how to do this job. Uh, so, like, you know, but insofar as they are training people, obviously they're doing more than I'm doing. So I've got to give them credit for that. Yeah, there was a, I remember a dispute in Philadelphia about, um, you know, purported racial discrimination in, mm -hmm. in one of the big unions mm -hmm. there. And the more people looked into it, the more it really looked like it wasn't racial discrimination per se. It was, well, it was nepotism. Yes. It was discrimination against yeah. people who didn't have Irish great grandparents. Yes, yes. Essentially, they were sort of yes, keeping uh, Yes, so it's like you got to be a family. standard. I think even some unions have officially had the rule of you got to be the son or nephew of an existing member. Right? Is that a fact? Yes. I, I believe I heard this from Murray Rothbard, who, though not always reliable in empirical matters, he knew his New York, New Jersey unions <laughs> really well. His dad actually blamed the unions for his father's early death. Uh, but you know, so like, you know, he grew up in that area. He knew how the unions worked, and he had a lot of extremely obscure details about particular unions if you listen to his economic history. So for there, I, I will trust him. I'll take a little uh, moment here to to just uh, a libertarian nerd question for you. So on a scale of one to 10, how crazy was Murray Rothbard? Wow. Hmm. 
I mean, it's a great question. I actually have a paper on the economics of mental illness. Okay. And a big part of my idea is, look, there's the people that are like, like truly, totally crazy, but then there's the people that act crazy, but if you're paying attention, they have it there's a there's a deeper wisdom where they basically know what they can get away with let me clarify that and, uh yes. not how mentally ill was murray yes. rothbard <laughs> although he certainly had some some issues how much of a crank was murray rothbard hmm what i'll say so in like 10 is 10 is crankiest 10 is crankiest yes i'll give him a seven okay a seven um, a genius and an incredible mm -hmm. polymath and then on, you know, like, like you know, basically he had the, the intelligence and the energy to sometimes get to the bottom of something that most people or were barely, uh, most even most experts in the field just refused to go and even look into. But on the other hand, he was also someone who, once he picked his answer, he would just stubbornly cling to that answer despite all of the evidence. And he, like often he would just outread everybody else. So he would have a pile of stuff that he hadn't, hadn't read to go and keep arguing his, arguing his case. Um, I mean, what I say is that you know, you know, he was someone who, if you could get him one on one, like I, I, I did actually get to talk on him one on one. I think once or twice in my life, um, like much more reasonable than you would think, hmm. because just you know, like super smart. And you know, you know, there's so many people who just want to say everyone who disagrees with me is stupid, and I just I was like that is so hmm. crazy. There's so many geniuses. There's so many people who are much smarter than me mm -hmm. that totally disagree with me on things, and it's just a lie to go and call them stupid. Yeah. You know, like the I'll say they're foolish, they're dogmatic, but it's stupid. No. One thing that gives me a little bit of of hope that we can do a better job on some of this stuff. Um, Perversely enough, is this sort of hipster longing for authenticity. So I remember reading the New York Times, they were writing about some guy who they described as a celebrity butcher in Brooklyn. And he has, I guess, these butchering classes that are expensive to take, and you've got to get on a six month waiting list to get on one of his, you know, weekend butchering seminars. And my father worked in a butcher shop in, I guess, Border, <laughs> Texas. And if you went back in 1959 and told him, one of these days there will be such a thing as a celebrity butcher. Butcher. Um, people would have thought you were nuts, but there is kind of a celebrity version of a lot of occupations. Oh, yeah. I often, you know, point to the the case of um, Jesse James, the motorcycle builder. I mean, that's not that, the bank robber. Not the bank robber. Is also it? celebrity. Also celebrity. Yeah, but you know, that's of course driven by reality television and other things. But there are kind of, you know, even outside of the world of re reality TV, there are sort of, for lack of a better term, sort of high end or celebrity versions of things that used to be thought of as just very blue collar occupations. So I think that, you know, if you would try to tell someone, well, a good job for you in life would be to be a butcher, um, maybe 40 or 50 years ago, they think that's actually not a great job. It's kind of maybe a low status job. It doesn't pay all that much. I got to work in a place where it's cold and chop meat all day. That doesn't sound all that great. But when there's a sort of change of, of a cultural attitudes and being a butcher is sort of a admirable thing to be, and they, they potentially anyway have some status, then um, that really changes that whole kind of you know outlook of that as a job. So if I'm if I'm skeptical about solutions that require us to improve the education system, I'm doubly skeptical about the solutions that requires to steer and improve the culture. Mm -hmm. But if there were a change in, in cultural opinions and attitudes towards certain kinds of jobs, where we didn't look at people as being, you know, somehow losers if they work in a, in a manual occupation or in a job that doesn't require a uh, enormous degree of education or that doesn't come with celebrity or some other marker of status, I think we could we could solve a lot of our problems. We could do ourselves a lot of good mm -hmm. by um, returning or developing a world in which, um, you know, being a butcher who has a successful butcher shop and makes a pretty good living. Mm -hmm. Um, is is a worthwhile yeah, thing define to define yourself as as you know as a small business owner. Yeah, right. Well, it's certainly yes. better for people who who own those businesses, yes, rather yes. than people who yes. are employees in those businesses. Do you have any thoughts about moving things in that direction, or ways to maybe press that conversation? If we were to go and follow my advice on defunding college, I think that would tremendously raise the status of people without college degrees, mm. because suddenly there's a whole bunch of very impressive people that didn't go to college. Right. And obviously, a lot of them are going to go get jobs. And so, uh, you know, some of them would be jobs that we now we think of as college jobs, but don't have to be. And but there's also other people that will just that previously would have gone to college and say, well, now, why don't I go and try being a celebrity butcher or, or whatever? So I think that's probably the number one thing to be done. Obviously, it's hard to go and get people to go and cut back college spending at all. 
people sometimes ask me, like, like people aren't really going to listen to you. Like, I know that. But if I could just give some moral courage to people that don't want to raise spending on college, I will consider my work to have totally paid for itself. I mean, much less cut it by 2%, you know, just something like that. So, you know, like, you know, you know, like normally, like in our culture, anyone who votes against more money, more, more money for college just feels like a heel. Yeah. It's like I'm some kind of ignoramus, I'm some kind of troglodyte, Neanderthal. And if I can, and they're saying, hey, here's some professors saying that actually this is money is a, this, this is just, you know, the money is, is a waste. Then if I can just sort of reinforce people that want to go want to vote against that, I will go and say, hey, I've done something good here. Yeah. You know, a political problem we've run into in, in Texas, for example, is that there are these kind of ideologically conservative efforts to reform or reduce spending on both K through 12 education universities mm-hmm. and things like that. And where they really run into the most resistance is from conservatives, uh, particularly conservatives in you know small, smaller towns and rural areas where the public schools or state university mm-hmm. is the largest employer. Yeah. And um, an argument that I've made often with, with the welfare system that the problem isn't really so much the recipients as it is the people who administer the programs. I mean, they're the ones who have the real political power and the really, really strong incentives mm-hmm. to prevent reform and change. So outside of education policy and defunding colleges and things like that, what do you think are the best policy things we could do to improve the um, situation of people who are looking for better jobs, who are looking for jobs to start with or to find more productive and rewarding work? Deregulation labor markets in general, but especially the whatever we can do to eviscerate labor lawsuits mm. is, a, is a big deal. So you're talking about portals, that kind of thing. So there's a growing bureaucratization of hiring. It's making it really hard for anyone that doesn't fit the standard mold to go and get the job that they want. And a lot of this really is a response to the fear of getting sued, to the sense of, well, we have to go and have a whole system based upon uh, following rules. It's not really like running a business. It's more like administering a program. I mean, the way this is developed is pretty striking because, you know, at first you just pass some laws saying you can't go and discriminate on the base of race. All right. Now, like initially, it's like, all right, fine, I won't do that. But the problem that people quickly found is, well, just saying that didn't seem to change things very much. We need to go and start ramping up the dials. We need to reinterpret the law. So you come up with things like hostile workplace law, where it's like, well, anything that makes anyone feel uncomfortable is actually discrimination. It's like, huh. So what doesn't make some people uncomfortable? All right, well, practically everything makes people uncomfortable, right? Or, or there's also uh, the disparate impact standard. Uh, in my book, The Case Against Education, I do say that I think this has been exaggerated, but still the real deal that someone can sue you for having a hiring process that is discriminatory in effect, even though no one actually intended it that way. Uh, you may have heard this a recent settlement where New York City is giving like over a million dollars each to a bunch of people that failed their teacher's exam. Really? Yes. <laughs> so, yes, it's a million dollars to each person who failed a test. The test had a lot of basic stuff about math, fractions, things like this. And, but, yeah, no, it turns out that's discriminatory. Now, the way that businesses have responded to this over time is that they say, well, let's, let's go and create a human resources department in order to go and handle this and to make sure we're not doing anything unfair. The people that you hire normally are fanatics who believe that discrimination is everywhere, and they basically become a fifth column of government regulators that are paid for by your own business. Uh, so this is why either don't hire these people or keep or keep it small or make sure they're really loyal to you, not the government when you hire them. And once they're there, a lot of though, mischief down in the human resources yes, department. Once they are there, then even though doing things that are, pro- are technically legal start to become a problem because it, get, it means that you have to go and tell people that are true believers in the wonder of this extremely bureaucratized system. Hey, uh, we're going to go and hire these people because they're better. I know they don't have the right credentials, but I know this guy and he's great. And like, how do you think a human resources fanatic is going to think about that? And eventually that person might be brought as a witness against you in a lawsuit. Mm. So there's all of this corruption going on. And so I would say a really big part of improving the system for people that don't fit the mold is just to get this is you know so deregulate as much as possible eviscerate so yes if there are any judges here i know you can't just get rid of a law that's on the books generally but you can eviscerate it you can interpret it very narrowly uh, my very good friend richard Nenya has a new book out, coming out called the origins of woke where look like 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that he would actually, like me, just like to get rid of discrimination laws entirely. But in the book, he says, look, all right, that's hopeless. But we can do is just only follow the law as written. And if we did that, the laws would barely make any difference because as written, the laws would, would, would just require intent. Right. So to go and successfully sue for someone for discrimination, you would basically need to have them on tape or in front of witnesses saying, I don't like you because you are Albanian. All right. And other than that, the laws would no longer have effect, which would mean that we could de-bureaucratize the system. You could fire your human resources people and start doing hiring the traditional way, which is. Like, I've got a good feeling about this person. Seems like this person could do the job. Let's try the person out. If they don't work out, we fire them. That's another thing that the bureaucratization of the system has made really hard is maybe, maybe not. Let's hire them, see how they work out. If we if we don't like them, flush them. Mm. What do you think about standardized testing? Yes. You know, yep. uh, mm-hmm. if, if the role of college, college education used to be mainly sorting and signaling, mm-hmm. and of course it doesn't do that very well anymore because so many people go to college, um, standardized testing might be a good way of, of substituting for that, don't you think? Or Yeah, so I am super pro standardized testing. Uh, it's not perfect. Of course, it's not perfect. It's made by humans. Nothing made by humans is perfect. But yes, it is a really good way of of getting a common metric. Uh, you know, it, this is this is why when you have standardized tests, the fact that one person goes to a really easy high school where they hand out A's like candy, another one goes to high school like with standards. Uh, you know, standardized tests are designed to go and handle that problem. Uh, it is still true that standardized tests are one way to get into top colleges, although, as you may have heard, uh, because of COVID slash George Floyd, most top colleges have gone test optional, which I assume would just be a farce, but I was wrong. It's not. About half the people getting into top schools are being let in without test scores. What's going on? Yeah, well, basically, those human resource type fanatics also run admissions departments, mm-hmm. and they are desperate to do massive social engineering of American society which means they are desperate to go and let in people from groups that they like that don't get good test scores on average. One thing that I think is generally wrong is that if standardized, if you could hire on standardized test scores, that then the college system would be dealt a devastating blow. This is something that I thought before I started my book on education, but writing the book, I learned a lot. And then I realized, look, it may be that it would be, I think it would be a good thing if you could hire based on standardized tests, but this is not the main reason why college has expanded so much. How do we know this? Well, first of all, before uh, standardized tests were ever legally criticized, they were still not used very much for testing. Second of all, uh, we actually have international data. We can see there's a bunch of countries like Japan where it would not be a problem to hire using standardized testing. They don't have our our, our, our scruples about it, mm. and yet it's still quite rare. Third point is actually there are actually a lot of businesses that do use standardized testing to hire right now. So it's not just that it Example. is. Yes. Um, I only know the percentages. Okay. So I know that if you just go and do surveys of businesses, something like 10 to 15 percent of American businesses will even admit on a survey they're using standardized tests. This was the data might be 15, 20 years old, but it's not 50 years old. Mm hmm. Um, so probably a good piece of legal advice is make it oral so that they can't subpoena what the test was gotcha. and then go and complain about it. Do you have real high test scores when you were in high school? I will even tell you my test scores. <laughs> uh, my S- my combined SAT was uh, 1420. Pretty this good. is back in the good old days when only about 10 people per year got 1600. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was probably like 98th, 99th percentile. It was not 99.9th. Yeah. Probably the reason why I got into the Princeton PhD program is I did get 99th percentile plus on analytical reasoning, mm. uh, which honestly, I had done a lot of those tests, probably got a little lucky. You know, normally I'd be missing two or three questions and I'd probably miss zero, but mm. that's probably what got me in, I think, because that was something that did stand out on my application. Well, I was thinking about my time as, uh, as a newspaper editor and, uh, you know, if an 18 year old had come to me with, uh, you know, 92nd percentile SAT scores and wanted a job but hadn't gone to college, I think I'd be willing to skip the college part of it and mm-hmm. just hire the person based mm-hmm. on the on the test. I mean, not just on the mm-hmm. test scores, but that certainly would be enough to to put them on my radar as someone if they're interested in, in that job in that position. They've obviously got mm-hmm. some um, some intellectual ability, so that sort of thing is always a, of interest to me. I mean, what I say in my book is that. You know, even if there's some legal problem with asking for test scores, there's no legal problem with offering test scores. So yes, on the one hand, if you do have them, it might be a really good idea to go and show them. And maybe there'll be someone who believes in standardized testing like you who takes it seriously. The main thing that I say in my book, though, is that 
the fact that it's quite rare for businesses to really try to weasel around the law. And remember, it's always possible to weasel. Weaseling is part of human nature and it's part of success in life because often the rules are so strict, you can't get anything done without weaseling around them. But anyway, what I say is that it's got to be the case that there's some reason why businesses should be skeptical of high test score, low education candidates. And my story is basically that generally people like that either have a problem with their work ethic or they just have a problem with sheer conformity. Mm. Right. And so in terms of data on that, it's hard to really get good data. But otherwise, I don't really see how to explain what's going on. Otherwise, why not just hire uh, people that, like, based on standardized test scores? Uh, people have even said, why not go and take your Harvard admission letter and then go straight to Goldman Sachs and say, hey, boom, I got into Harvard. Hire me now. It's not like they're going to teach me anything very useful there. And uh, we don't see this happening. Yeah. I think it would probably be legal. But I think the people at Goldman Sachs are like, hmm, given that almost everyone who goes to Harvard finishes, why are you the person that's trying to do this other weird thing? You kind of make me nervous that you're an oddball. There's no I in team. We don't want to have a person that's going to do something so unconventional. Hmm. And yeah, anytime a business says, oh, we love free thinkers, unconventional thinkers, within narrow limits. Yeah. You don't want someone who's such a free thinker who says, I should be the CEO. You should work for me. That's my creativity. It's like, yeah, we don't want you to be that creative. Gotcha. Labor Econ versus the World. Tell us about it. It's the first book in my series of essays. I've been teaching labor economics for over 20 years. I am very passionate about labor economics because the labor market is the biggest market in the world. It is one where almost everybody has very strong opinions about it, even if they don't think about it under the rubric of labor economics. And what I say is most of what people feel leads to the support of very bad policies. Examples. All right, let's start with the simplest one, the minimum wage. This is one where is that only, simple? Yes. It's pretty simple actually. You know, if you passed a million minimum wage of a million dollars an hour, what do you think is gonna happen? A ton of people want to work, but hardly anyone want anybody wants to hire. All right, duh. And yet most people have this religion of supporting the minimum wage, like, oh, how horrible. You know, anyone who opposes the minimum wage hates poor people and wants them to starve. And it's like, no. Like this is just like any other price control. Like there is is an obvious downside of the minimum wage, which is that if you make people pay a larger amount of money, it means that people are going to be less willing to hire. Like, oh, oh, but it wouldn't be if it were only $15. What a ridiculous dogma. It's like saying that cutting the price of a shirt from $20 down to 10 won't make any difference. Sure, if a shirt, shirt, shirt will cost $50, that might matter, but it couldn't possibly matter in the range from 20 to 10. It's like, it always matters. There's always someone who cares. Just think about who you would hire if wages were lower? Might you want a personal assistant if wages were sufficiently low? We can just take a look at other countries where wages are lower and see they use humans for things we don't use humans for. Right? So like in poor countries, it'll, a person will do something that a machine would do here. Obviously, there's substitution. Obviously, it does change people's minds about what they want to do. Furthermore, what is clear is that even people who are minimum wage activists actually believe the criticisms of their own view. How do we know this? Well, here's one telltale sign. Almost always when you raise the minimum wage, there's a phase in. It's like, well, the minimum wage is going to rise up by $2 starting in a year. Hmm. If anyone who opposes raising the minimum wage as much, as much as possible is an enemy of the workers, why wait? Why not raise it maximally today? If you just get inside the head of someone who has come up with this, like, I see what you're doing. You want to go and raise them in a wage and obscure the fact that it reduces the number of people get hired by, by delaying it and making it come in in phases. And yet, obviously, the end result is the same. Right. And this is another one that I love. Now, yeah. Someone's going to send me an email with a link to 20 studies yeah. that says, well, they raised the minimum wage in Chicago yes. here. And yeah. then there wasn't any change in, in, in employment. Mm -hmm. So are these all BS? Look, the studies are often pretty good. Here's the problem. Um, well, there's several problems. One is the amount of brain power going into rationalizing this junk is through the roof. Earlier, I mentioned that there are many very smart people who disagree with me. Mm -hmm. This holds true in the minimum wage. But the amount of effort they are making to proving that water flows uphill is so incredible that they do manage to go and find some evidence that convinces them. Um, like if you go through the studies themselves, the obvious problem is almost all of them are looking at only very short term effects. Why? 
because, well, it would be really hard to measure the long-term effects. And yet, isn't it obvious the long-term effects are going to be there? We can just go and look at poor countries and see that they use human beings for things we never use human beings for here to show that if we were to go and raise the minimum wage in the long run, we would be coming up with other technologies in order to go and save on labor costs, of course. You know, the same people that say the minimum wage doesn't matter will say, oh, these horrible American companies are moving their jobs overseas. Um, why are they moving jobs overseas? To save money. So obviously... They believe, just like I do, that employers are responsible to labor costs. Well, the main problem with those studies, from my point of view, has always been the fact that you can't actually measure the relevant variable. You know, the question isn't employment today versus what employment was. It's well, what employment was versus what it would be without the policy change. Yes. I mean, you know, like, like, model. Yeah. There are super smart people who are totally aware of your question, and they think they've answered it to their satisfaction. Um, my teacher, David Card, has a famous study with Alan Kruger, where they said, well, we're going to go and compare New Jersey versus Pennsylvania. And they say, like, be right before the minimum wage, these two states were almost exactly the same. We're looking at places that are right close to each other geographically. Again, what they aren't able to do is the long run thing, which is the most interesting question, really. I mean, like another one that's very similar is, oh, like, will uh, you requiring employers to pay for health insurance reduce employment? Well, uh, there's a really funny footnote in the law that says that you only have to go and pay health insurance if your employees work 30 and a half hours per week or more. What's going on? Even the people who wrote the laws realized that if they were to require every employee to get full health insurance, that there would no longer be any jobs for five or 10 hours a week, mm -hmm. right? And then it's okay. So if you believe that enough to go and change your own law to go and deal with it, what makes you think that the general point is wrong? And they've got nothing other than anger to go and answer. Now, the minimum wage in the United States right now is almost of no importance whatsoever, the federal minimum wage. Because after COVID, after the high inflation, almost no one in America earns the federal minimum wage anymore. Uh, but I like to talk about it because it's a symbol of a general terrible way of thinking about labor markets, which is that progress comes from government. If you want something good to happen, government has to pass a law. And if you once you pass the law, there will be good good thing, things will improve with no negative side effects. This is the rationale for almost all labor market regulation. Uh, we can see the logical effect of this in most of the countries in Europe where they have a lot more labor reg regulation. And they do get the standard textbook negative side effect of labor regulation, which is permanent high unemployment. Uh, we can see this in almost all of the countries of Western Europe. The exceptions are interesting because they are the three countries that de did the most to deregulate the, your labor market, their labor markets. So, you know, Germany, UK, and the Netherlands deregulated the labor markets a lot. Before the deregulation, they had typical high European unemployment. Afterwards, their unemployment went down to much lower levels. So again, this is you know, this is something where the big story does work. And again, it's one where I think you'd have to be pretty dogmatic just to deny the basic logic of the government says that you have to give every worker high pay, great benefits, that and and furthermore that it's really hard to fire people. Put that one on. Mm -hmm. Do you hate workers? They shouldn't. You shouldn't be able to fire a worker just because you don't think he's doing a good job. Put all the or you should be able to sue your employer if if you don't like the way he's treating you. Uh, turn up all these dials enough, and people don't want to hire. Right. And especially who do they really not want to hire? You know, low skilled, inexperienced workers. And then for many countries like, I don't know, France, it's a really big deal, especially for people that don't speak French very well. Mm -hmm. People that are new immigrants, people where where employers will be more nervous. Maybe this person isn't going to fit in here, isn't going to be a good member of the team. In a free labor market, employers have a much greater possibility to say, well, look, I'll, I can save a lot of money on this person. Maybe they'll work out. Maybe they won't. If I don't like them, I'll get rid of them. Um, probably the best way to think about, especially the worst kind of American labor regulations are our lawsuits. Right. And this really does come down to imagine that you knew that Brian Kaplan could sue you for a million dollars for any affront to his dignity if you hired him. And furthermore, imagine that you had a kangaroo court run by my family. What would this do to what well, would this be good or bad for me? Well, since I already have a job, it's awesome for me. I could basically shake down George Mason. I could make them do whatever I wanted. Like, well, look, uh, like I'm going to go and sue you a thousand times today unless you do exactly what I say. But what if you don't have a job yet? If you don't have a job yet, then the right to sue, especially in a kangaroo court, is terrible because people will say, oh, well, your qualifications are really impressive. We'll get back to you. It's like, 
do not hire that person. They could be the mark of death. Yeah, you reminded me there was a study in Sweden some time ago about attitudes toward immigrants. And apparently there's a fair amount of workplace discrimination, hiring discrimination against immigrants in, in Sweden. And the same study found that the um, the complaint that the Swedes had about immigrants is that they don't want to work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we won't hire them for this job because they're, they, don't, they don't want to get jobs. Um, of course, people who are mm -hmm. applying for jobs mm -hmm. seem to want jobs. Mm -hmm. so that's why they're applying for jobs. It's a uh, it's a weird kind of uh, not quite circular reasoning, but uh, but reverse mm -hmm. reasoning. I wouldn't be so harsh. I would say, look, you know, there are different work ethics around the world. Obviously, some groups are famous for having really good work ethics. Mm -hmm. Some groups are really famous for having bad work ethics. It's possible that these reputations are completely undeserved, but I doubt it. Uh, what I would say is that in a regulated marketplace, there's still an incentive to give someone a chance, even if you've got a, even if you have a generally justified negative stereotype, stereotype about their group, which is, well, maybe this person's an exception. Let's give them a chance. Mm. What's the big deal? Uh, like we need a worker right now. We let them work for a couple of weeks, see what happens. So I would say that in an unregulated market, it is much easier for people to overcome a negative stereotype. And especially if the stereotypes actually are true, this is a big concern because if a stereotype is false, a shrewd business person will say, oh, that's a lot of malarkey. I don't care. But what if the stereotype is actually true? Mm. Like what? Like suppose that you are a taxi driver and you've got the true stereotype that men are much more likely to mug you than women. Well, back in the old days, there's a reason to not pick up men at night, especially young men. All right. But what happened with Uber? Uber came up with a way of giving individual ratings. So this guy mugged me one star. All right. Uh, that is a, one of the great features of markets is that if they can get to the bottom of what you're like as an individual, they want to. They have an incentive to do so. On the other hand, I wouldn't want to go and lash out at businesses who aren't able to go and figure it out and say, oh, you're just being terrible racist. Like, well, maybe there is something going on here with statistics and maybe the law is really has a, has a gun to their backs and they are and they realize, look, we can't just use the statistics. We'll get in trouble. Like if we hire and then fire disproportionately, we will get sued. Maybe we just don't hire at all. We'll fly below radar. And no one will complain. This, by the way, is the great fundamental glaring, ridiculous part of discrimination lawsuits, which is if you really didn't like a member of a group, your safest thing is to not hire them in the first place. Mm. And yet almost all employment lawsuits are brought by a current or aggrieved employee, someone that you gave a chance. It's much more post-judice than prejudice. It seems to me, though, that if someone gets out of bed and comes across town and gets on a bus and comes to my office asking for a job, the most reasonable explanation <laughs> is that they want a job. Yes, uh, they want a job, but how committed are they? There's still a range of commitment. I mean, just think about any job you've ever had. Every person there wanted a job, and yet they don't all have an equal level of motivation, do they? Uh, one of my favorite questions to ask my labor econ students is, first of all, how many people have ever, ever had a job? It's George Mason, so basically all the hands go up. I say, all right, how many people have ever had, ever had a job where there was a coworker who was generally acknowledged to be incompetent? All hands stay up. All hands stay up. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is something that is one of the great puzzles of labor econ, which is why haven't all the incompetent people been fired already? One story is lawsuits. Uh, but I have actually looked into this, too. Um, here's another big part of it. A lot of employers are nice. Mm. There's Mr. Burns on The Simpsons who takes sadistic glee and saying, Smithers, fire that man. There's almost no human beings like that. So um, minimum wage and tort reform. Are there other big... Uh policy pictures in the labor world that we should be looking at and thinking about? Labor regulation in general is what we should really be focusing on. So, uh, so you know, occupational licensing, you mentioned that, that is a big deal. It is now so much of a bigger deal than unions. And yet labor economics textbooks have still not got the memo. Still very common to have like, two full chapters on labor unions, even though it's about 10% of the workforce. Occupational licensing is about 30% of the workforce. You're lucky to get a text box on labor licensing. Right. The, um, again, there's something where people almost immediately start thinking about, do you want to have, you know, terrible surgeons butchering people, killing them? It's like, all right, first of all, almost none of the licensing is for anything that is remotely that sensitive. We license barbers in every state. What are you worried about? A bad haircut? 
Let me, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we can't just have the basic repeat business, word of mouth, Yelp reviews. We can't allow that to go and handle it without worrying about licensing them. How ridiculous. Yeah, so yeah, we license florists. You're going to get a bad flower arrangement. Um, again, like add it all up, it comes up to 30% of the labor force where you are keeping people out of jobs that at least some employer might consider them totally qualified for. Why not leave it up to the employer to decide whether or not it's worthwhile or the customer decide whether or not they got a good deal. I actually am abolitionist on this. I think we should get rid of medical licensing too. We have to remember what would happen instead. It would it just be like Dr. Nick Riviere on The Simpsons going, hi, everybody, I'm going to amputate something. Like, it wouldn't be like that. It would you know, Rather, you would see that there would be corporations, businesses that employ doctors, and it would be their concern to protect their reputation, to hire people that are qualified, not just whether or not you have a license. And obviously, you know, malpractice insurance would play a role here. They're not just going to go in and, and offer the insurance to anybody. There's, they're going to be monitoring it. The, what do we get out of all of this? What is, what, is, what is so much better about getting rid of the licensing? The fact that you can save a pile of money because most of what doctors do is not is more like barbering than it is like brain surgery. Like you know, the der dermatologists, some of them cure skin cancer. Most of them handle acne. And yet, either way, you've got to have an MD, right? Uh, we do have some good evidence for states that allow the intermediate occupation of nurse of a nurse practitioner to have a wider latitude. Uh, the main results is that we don't see any higher rate of medical accidents or any, any actual problems. What we do see is cheaper prices. So yes, if there were greater competition in those areas, then medical care would be more affordable. And always remember, uh, if the price is high enough, someone might just not do it. Yeah, there's also some fun papers, uh, perhaps too good to be true, but I'll still repeat them because they are cool. Finding things like, in states with stricter licensing electricians, more people die from trying to do their own electricity. Right, so yes, licensing kills. <laughs> right. like you get like actually like through, you know, like it's not the case that it, that if you make sure that all electricians are top notch that everybody hires them instead people say that's too expensive I will go and spend my money on so, on, on something else uh, you know, on, on doing it myself yeah but you know in general just focusing on like what is this going to do in unemployment is this going to cause permanent unemployment do we want to end up like Europe if people in America could just understand that phrase end up like Europe. Of course, as a tourist, you go there, what, end up having like beautiful, charming downtowns? It's like, no, that's not what I mean by end up like Europe. What I mean by end up like Europe is permanently have 10% unemployment, right? Have 25% unemployment for young people. Like, do we want that? Isn't that terrible, right? And especially when you remember that uh, the main way that people get a better job is by starting with a worse job. This is just common sense, but it's what, you know, there's an old cartoon that shows the minimum wage going and cutting out the bottom rungs of a ladder of progress, mm -hmm. right? It's a good cartoon. It's truth. You might think it's cheesy, but yes, if you get a job at McDonald's for minimum wage, that would almost never happen these days, but still it used to. Like, what do you need to do to get a raise? Basically, you just need to stay there for three months and you always get a raise. It's totally built in. Like you just stay there for a bit longer. Very soon you're an assistant manager. It is not true that there are dead end jobs where you get paid the minimum wage forever unless you have a real serious problem. I mean, we rather remember that first law of wing walking that I mentioned. Just take the best job you can get and work your way up and have a good attitude. Right. And, uh, and you know, you know, like, did you have a good attitude, Brian, when you were doing your Dickensian uh, you know, newspaper assembly job? It wasn't a perfect attitude, but still, like I was with my friends and you know, was like, always try to make the best of things. Yeah. That is my advice to everyone all the time. You know, the first piece I ever wrote for National Review was on uh, Labor Day. And it was about the fact that in spite of you know, having worked in some pretty modest jobs, including at Burger King and 7-Eleven, I was never even offered minimum wage, uh, much less paid yeah. minimum wage. is always in excess. I mean, a lot of it depends upon what part of the country we're in, what region the country we're in. I mean, basically, the federal minimum wage is like most likely to buy in like rural Mississippi, someplace like that, which, again, like just gives you an idea of how bogus it is that, you know, like, like you know, one minimum wage for the entire country, states can raise it. But still, like, you know, and again, like the, you know, the classic story, a lot of the minimum wage is about going and just try to keep businesses from doing what they do, which is move to places with lower cost labor in order to make money and provide better opportunities for people in those parts of the country.
Labor Econ versus the World. You can get it for just 12 bucks on Amazon, $9.99 for the ebook. And actually, there's three other books of essays as well as all of my other books there. Probably the one the most relevant right now is The Case Against Education. Uh, final question for you, one I'm always interested in. If you weren't doing what you're doing now or something a lot like what you're doing now, what do you think your next best choice in life would have been? I probably would have gone into CS. I liked programming when I was a kid. I was in California as C when CS took off. So if I nothing else uh, really appealed to me, then I think I would have put a lot more work into that and tried to get good. And I mean, of course, my daydream is then I'd be a billionaire. But uh, like, of course, I know that you know, mo most people are fantastic programmers, still don't become billionaires. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I would probably do something like that. I really do like the logic, the analytical reasoning. I liked it in a sense. I mean, the main thing with, when I was a programmer is it has highs, extreme highs and extreme lows that you don't get as a professor. Mm. So the program works, yes! The program fails, ah! Like, when you're a professor, most days don't have anything in that ballpark of emotional extremes. It's more like, all right, got another page done, another page done. And even when, like, your book finally gets accepted, it's at the end of such a long bureaucratic process, no step feels like a great triumph. I guess the high highs or low lows I got when I was an assistant professor and I was really worried about losing my job uh, because the system is uh, you have like a six year trial period and then either you get a dream job for life or you're fired. Mm -hmm. So early on, I took the acceptance letters or rejection letters really seriously. So that was a little bit like it, but still, it wasn't the same kind of real time highs and lows. Uh, but yeah, so I think CS is totally what I would have done. Otherwise, I would have been at least reasonably good at it. It would have paid the bills. I was in the right location of the world for it to be a viable career. So I think it would have been that. And if you if you had become a, a Silicon Valley billionaire, would your life actually be a lot different with a billion dollars? Hmm. As you strike me as someone yes. who probably is, is um, going to be living the same sort of life for the most part, um, irrespective of... Uh, of that. Yeah. So if I did make a lot of money in CS, there's really two scenarios. One is I discover that what I really love is the world of ideas, and then I just retire early and then become like a, a adjunct professor or something somewhere, or just become a hanger on at some academic department. Uh, the other one, though, is I just get really into the game of being a an, an entrepreneur. And I, th I think that I still would have really enjoyed talking about ideas, but it would have been much more of a hobby. So I mean, I can definitely see just the sheer joy of getting to be a serial business founder. Mm -hmm. uh, during COVID, I spent a lot of time hanging out with my great friend, Steve Kuhn, who owns Major, Major League Pickleball. I got to actually be in his car while he was starting businesses. He had many different balls that he was juggling. And I got to find out what is the difference between being a, an incredibly successful business guy and being a normal human. What is it? And here's, here's the answer. When a normal human tells me their business ideas, I have an immediate reaction. That is a terrible idea. It's absurd. You will never make a dime of money. Don't do it. When I would hear Steve's business ideas, I'd l let him finish and say, huh, maybe. And that's the difference. He never told me an idea was like, that's going to be a billionaire idea. It's fantastic. But his ideas were well thought, out, well, well thought out enough. They had enough detail. They had enough attention to who will, will be paying me money here. What will the cost be? That when he told me the idea, I would actually be engaged and say, that's a possibility. And he'd be the first person to say most of his, ide most of his ideas are total failures. But the successes are what makes him the incredibly wealthy and fascinating guy that he is. Go Pickleball. Ryan, thanks so much for being here. I enjoyed the conversation. All right. All right. Fantastic.